back at Queen's Festival. My name is Kerita Zalashvili. I'm the host of this event. And now it is time to have speakers from American continent. And of course, Queen's Festival cannot happen if we don't, if we don't have a speaker like Jennifer Shahad, a woman grandmaster from USA. Um, also a uh, biggest supporter of uh, girls in USA, director of um, uh, chess program for girls uh, in, in USA, as well as a commentator, um, also the champion uh, several times of U uh, USA uh, Women Championship, and so on and so on, and also the author of uh, chess books and also a poker player, Jennifer. <laughs> there are many things, many things uh, about you. And um, I'm so happy to have you here uh, as our speaker. How are you feeling today? Oh, great. Thank you for asking. I hope you're feeling well. You look great with this wonderful background. <laughs> Love all the, uh, the floating chess pieces. Yes, yes, yes. And this is the first time ever when I have to, I have to do this at this time. It is midnight over here in Europe. Um, 
But that's that's sort of fun as well. It's kind of challenge as well, and I hope everything go will go smoothly. And uh, I can't wait to hear your presentation, Jennifer. Yeah, well, thank you for staying up, um, Kebby, for this presentation. Um, <laughs> we, I'm, I usually am pretty fast and energetic, so we'll get you to bed pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, this is a very important topic to me, of course, mm -hmm. um, getting more girls and women into the event, into the game of chess, um, both through women's activities and through open activities, right? Mm -hmm. So um, my mission as part of U.S. Chess Women is to get more girls and women into the game to make the game better, because I think that when there are more girls and women in the game, it is a more pleasant culture for everyone. And there's also so many benefits of chess that apply specifically to girls and women, or even not specifically, but even more prominently to girls and women. So I'll start a little bit with my own story and how that influences my approach to girls and women in chess and some of the goals that I have for the future. So I actually started playing chess when I was super young, which is so typical for chess champions. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a photo of me um, playing against my brother when we were four years old and two years old, respectively. And oh, we for have those this of you who photo, don't know, right? Yes, in yes, our that's presentation. Right. Let's see. Let's see. This is a famous family photograph. <laughs> see, I'm I'm two there. I don't think I really quite know how to play chess yet, and my brother is four. For those of you who don't know, my brother is an international chess master, and he's also um, a great advocate for the game. Is he? has um, an active YouTube channel and he's a very, very good blitz player. Um, he's more like grandmaster in blitz. Uh, and he has two programs, the Pro Chess League and also, which was the US Chess League before mm -hmm. it um, transitioned to chess.com's Pro Chess League. And then he's also the founder of the US Chess School. So even though this picture took place when we were four and two years old, we both stuck with it over the decades. and. Hopefully both of us um, have not only enriched our own lives, but enriched the lives of other people through this great game, which is a magnificent networking tool. So yeah, I started chess when I was really young. It's a very typical story for chess champions, but I had some bumps in the road mm -hmm. and that's a little bit rarer, I think, for people who get to a high level um, quite quickly. Um, when I was 13 years old, if you go to the next slide, or maybe 11, 12, around mm -hmm. that age, I actually gave up chess for a little while. Oh, soon after I really? Yeah, soon after this photo was taken, I stopped playing chess, 11, 12, maybe I played a little bit, but very little, like I wasn't studying. My brother, on the other hand, was an absolute dynamo. He was the youngest chess master in Pennsylvania and one of the youngest in the country. Um, and so I just thought like, you know, chess is my brother's thing. I'll go off and do other stuff mm -hmm. a little bit more on the creative side, acting, writing, things that turned out to be part of my life forever as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason that the story is so important to me is because this is what happens to so many girls and not just in chess and a lot of other fields as well, that they are super into it when they're small children. But then when adolescence comes, they get self-conscious if they're the only girl, maybe they get bullied more if it's a field that there's mostly boys in. Mm -hmm. And so it's an age where we have to like really fight to keep more girls in. And if you take a look at the next slide, you'll see the statistics at the United States Chess Federation. And that's where my program US Chess Women is. And this is um, showing about how both female and male membership at US Chess is very concentrated at young ages. And that's, that's really a testament to our scholastic program. So it's not all bad news. I mean, it's great that a lot of young children play chess kindergarten through sixth grade. And then sometimes they do other things afterwards because, you know, they've gotten like some great memories and life skills and cognitive skills from chess, but they want to go on to the thing they're most interested in. That's totally fine. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of people who leave it because, um, you know, maybe their friends aren't in anymore. Reasons that I feel like we can overcome and allow them to stay in chess a little longer. Now, you'll notice that boys and girls, the highest concentration of ages are 6 to 10 years old, 11 to 15 years old. 
but it's way more dramatic for women. Look at that mm-hmm. tiny little sliver of the pie for 50 plus or for 16 to 20. Um, very, very small amount of adult and teen women who are playing chess. Teen girls and adult women, rather, I should say. So let's move to the next slide and you can see that in more drastic form. Okay, this is a, a chart which shows us the um, raw numbers of female players in each age group. And you see that at 10 years old, we have a spike. Like That is where most of the girls are. Mm-hmm. And um, there's this drop off, especially from 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 13, and 13 to 14. And yet th- those are the exact ages that I stopped playing. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm really lucky because I come from a chess family. I was able to pop back into the game when I kind of reignited that interest in my teen years. I think it was like 11 to 13. I was a little less interested. Um, But this chart, I think, really shows us what's going on. Girls love the chess as little kids, and a lot of them stop playing when they're 11, 12, and 13. So, you know, it's obvious that we need to try make a bigger effort to get girls at that age to love it so much that they don't do it. That's that's absolutely, uh, there was the absolutely uh, case also in, in my country, in Georgia. Um, looking at this chart, I think it was exactly the same. Like uh, girls at the age of 10, 12 were uh, double number than boys, but then it's changed at the age of 14, 16, 18. Then we had girl tournaments with 10 girls only, and it was something really strange while at the age of 10 we had more than 100 girls uh, participating in the tournaments yeah yeah so it happens all over the world i mean in your country in georgia there's such a great um women's chess tradition so maybe it's not as it it is more popular for girls probably than almost any country like Mm -hmm. if you go to um the, the national federation of georgia Mm-hmm. What percentage of the players are female versus male? No. Yeah, I have to go there. <laughs> but you I think nowadays, but- nowadays it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. Yeah. And there yeah, are think- not too many, too many active female players. There's not as, so it's not as, not, it's not as much as it used to be when, you know, you had, and, uh, yeah. And Jennifer, the, uh, many girls changed their federations as well when at the uh, at the a- adult adult age. That's also an issue, right? True, mm-hmm. true. including some American players. We have mm-hmm. Nazi Pakidzi and Rusadhan Golatiani, both both great women who have done a lot for American women's chess as well. But yes, I mean, I know that recently there was a movie out about Georgian women's chess. Um, mm-hmm. Did you, did you see it, Kerry? Yes, yes, I saw that. I had had the opportunity. It was beautiful, beautiful movie. Yeah, it was really well done. And I, I, I saw an interview with the uh, filmmaker, and she just seemed so passionate and talented. It was called um, The Queen. Uh, can you remember Glory. the title? It's escaping me now. But uh, Glory, Glory of... the Queen. Glory to the Queen. Glory, yeah. Glory to the Queen. Yeah, Glory to the Queen. I, yeah, that's what it was it translated to in English, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, okay, we can go to the next slide with me mm-hmm. playing. I think I was probably around 15 or 16 in this next slide. So, um, in this one, I'm playing against Grandmaster, now Grandmaster, at the time you see that she was a national master, um, Irina Krosh. And this was, I think, a pretty famous game for me, actually. I lost the game, <laughs> but it was the tournament where Irina Krosh got eight and a half out of nine. I think this was the one, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm wrong. This was one year before that. I think this was one year before that. You know how I know? Because she had castled queenside in that game and checkmated in me. <laughs> so this can't be it. I see that king on G1. But you anyway, remember Irina... that. <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> how can you castle queenside and have your king on G1? <laughs> Irina was a good friend of mine. She was always a little higher rated than me, sometimes a lot higher rated than me, um, but somewhere between a little and a lot. And she had a good score against me too, especially with the white pieces. I had struggled with her 1d4 opening a lot. But I think what was interesting about Irina for me was that 
because she was always a little better than me and um, because we were good friends, I always had something to shoot for. You know, I was always like trying to, you know, beat Irina or do as well as her in a tournament. And because she was so strong, that was a great goal to have. I mean, I think that that's one thing that friendship does for you in chess, that mm -hmm. your friends, you, you know, you love them, but you also really want to beat them as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, you analyze with them. And so having somebody in my generation who was so good at chess, I think really lifted my chess up because I knew, you know, how am I going to win the U.S. Women's Championship if I don't get to as good as Irina or close to as good as her, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do it, right? So I, I had to kind of like fight for that. And to me, how that connects with this topic is that girls like to make friends with each other so that they can travel to tournaments and so that they can um, grow together. And that's why it's so important to foster places where girls and women can make friends in chess. Uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but it's one of the reasons that the girls club initiative and girls chess camps and girls chess trainings are so important to me. Mm -hmm. And then um, that U.S. Women's Championship, I definitely did not win. Um, I think I did okay, but it was one of my first. And then several years later, I was able to win. That one was in Seattle and uh, it was definitely, you can show the slide of me on the cover mm -hmm. of Chess Life. Let's see this it was one. definitely a very memorable experience for me because I was not the highest rated woman in the event. I was never the highest rated in the different events that I won. And I felt like I'm very proud of myself that I was able to um, use my chess skills in combination with my preparation skills. So one thing that I was always good at in chess was preparing mm -hmm. um, and Tournaments like the U.S. Women's Championship or like the U.S. Junior Championship, Olympiads, those are tournaments that not only could you bring what you had to the table, you also had that opportunity to study before and practice for your opponent. And that's a really key skill that you can develop from chess. Um, and yeah, this is, this is actually a tournament where women and men were combined together. So the woman who got the most points became the U.S. Women's Champion. Uh, this idea only lived for a few years, but I really think it's fantastic. I love things like this. I love Gibraltar. I love what Judah Polgar is doing with Play Magnus, with the, uh, the Challengers Tour, where it's a combination of girls and boys, um, because I think that girls' tournaments are wonderful and they have their place, but it's also good to be creative and think of ways that we can mix everybody together um, because uh, it is very engaging for both the media and for the players. Mm -hmm. And so, as I mentioned before, um, with my work with the women's program at US Chess, I'm very, very focused on getting more girls and teens to stick with the game. So the next few slides show examples of pre-pandemic activities where I went to schools and we organized girls chess clubs at various tournaments, including our own national events, like the um, US uh, grade nationals, the US chess K through 12 high school championships. You can go to the next slide as well if you'd like. This one's actually at another organizer's event, um, Robin Ramson, who runs Chess Girls DC. So here I am analyzing with uh, two girls that I know from many chess events. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a picture from a girls club at one of our mixed national events. So this is an initiative that we are very proud of. The women, U.S. Chess Women's Committee um, had this idea five years ago or six years ago to have a space in a mixed tournament that was just for girls. Mm -hmm. And it's ideas that you're not separating girls, they're still playing in the main tournament. But here's an, a special space for them to make friends with each other mm -hmm. and to play me or we've had Irina Crush, you know, the, the aforementioned Nazi Pakidzi. We've had mm -hmm. players like this come to give chess simuls or talk about chess. Um, we've had, you know, arts and crafts for the littler kids where they like make a card if it's Mother's Day 
or, uh, you know, near the holidays, they might make Christmas cards in between rounds. So it it's a place where we feel like girls can make friends while still going out and competing in the open fields. And to me, this was very powerful. And uh, it's it's one of my favorite initiatives that we do. Yes. And um, I believe that uh, it's, uh, this experience will stay um, for, for these girls forever. Um, because when myself, I remember when I had some activities, uh, side activities, a part of chess main tournaments, I still remember everything what was happening there. And I'm sure, I'm sure um, they'll make friends there and all these activities will stay with them forever. And this is really brilliant idea. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, we have Women's International Master Carolina Blanco there in the picture as well. Um, she's a dentist and uh, a chess champion, um, originally from Venezuela and now living in the United States. So that's another thing that's really important to us with our, our work is um, we really are trying to get a diversity of programming, diversity of guests, um, like Carolina and um, Yvette Garcia um, also talk to the girls about chess and Spanish so that the ones who are learning Spanish as a second language and the ones who are native speakers can, you know, either feel really excited that they are hearing chess in, in the native language or learn a little bit of extra credit for school that they now know how to speak chess in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Carolina once gave a lesson for us. And it's funny, there's a native speaker there, but she was struggling with the algebraic notation because she learned chess so, so young um, she learned um, Spanish so young, but in school she was always learning English, right? Mm -hmm. So even though she was a fluent speaker, like the letters and numbers were like not that easy for her. So that, it was like a cool way for her to like connect with her native language. And so we can move on, but I'm going to get more into that about our um, life skills and like cross curriculum education in chess. That so we try not to just teach chess, but also teach skills adjacent to chess. Because we know that not everybody is going to go on to become a women's chess champion, to become a US chess champion, to even continue playing chess in college. I mean, realistically, we I would love as many to do it as possible because I think they have so much to get from chess. But some people will just develop other interests that take up a lot of time. That's fine and normal. Um, but if we can give them some lessons from chess that live with them forever, like you said, something they remember forever, um, that's that's what we want to do. It's an educational tool, Chess. This is a video that I'm going to show you later um, mm -hmm. that kind of shows the importance of girls in women's tournaments. Because even though before I said I'm a huge fan of girls and women's playing in open events and having various incentives for them, I still also really like girls' events. I just like a combination, you know. And um, girls' events are can be controversial, especially in the United States, because we are hearing often, why do you have girls tournaments when chess is an intellectual endeavor? So uh, this video speaks to that. And I think we're going to show it to you at the end of this, um, yes. this session. All right, let's move to the next slide. Yes, and let's move to 2020 in April. So in April 2020, um, obviously, uh, the world changed for everyone. And in particular, live events, live chess classes, most live schooling um, was interrupted um, by the pandemic as people transitioned to remote learning. And so in chess, this was easier than for a lot of fields, right? We had an opportunity to harness online tools to keep the kids connected. And so for our girls club, um, what I did was we started arranging events with great female players and leaders and girls of all different levels. And it, from the very beginning, my goal was I want to educate these girls, but I also want to entertain them because this is a terrible time, you know, very difficult time. So I want them to make friends. I want them to have fun. And that was really the goal. And it was extremely successful. You know, we had hundreds of girls signing up, it, you know, we sometimes often had more than a hundred girls in a, in a single session. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
they were all chatting and making friends. And, you know, people often ask me about how I make that work. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple secrets to how successful our online chess schooling events are. One of them is that I always have at least a a co-host and a lecturer um, because it's important to like manage the chat and sometimes even more if I'm expecting a lot of people. And then the other is that we try very hard to create a curriculum with each teacher that can reach a wide range of levels. Um, Like for instance, I'd say in our classes, we have people ranging from around 800 level. So, you know, that's somebody who knows the pieces and knows some checkmates Mm -hmm. to about 1800, maybe even 1900. Mm -hmm. So it sounds difficult to reach all those levels, but it really is possible um, because you can throw in some basic questions, throw in some polling questions to make sure everybody's following. But that's the sweet spot, 800 to 1800, 800 to 1900. Um, So one of our guests was none other than the legendary Gary Kasparov, who came to speak to the Girls Club after the Queen's Gambit came out Mm -hmm. um, to talk about his role consulting on the series. Yeah. Um, If you want to, I think we might be able to play this video. All right. um, that's, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. That's for this invitation. Oh, here I it is. I hope that yeah. this, this, this series and- uh, I don't think there's sound though. And, uh, and the, the coverage Maybe of the series will, will help- Tell us in the chat chess, if there's sound. Uh, in America, I will move on to something else. Um, uh, American uh, it's it's terrible, chess, however, and it will uh, we can't. And it will elevate the status <laughs> of the game to, to where it belongs. I, you and I, it's just, okay, it's got the, it. it's, I think the female chess has been neglected for so long. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you you heard that one? Yes. Yes. Um. By the way, I'm saying hi to the chat. Feel free to keep any questions coming. There's one player from Indonesia who just said hello. Um. Hello to you too. You know, I actually had Irene Sukandar, the top female player from Indonesia, recently on my podcast, Ladies Night, and she is amazing. So shout out to um all the Indonesian fans, um chess fans, as I know that you guys really like chess there. So oh, uh, yes. we can move to the they next do one. love they do love chess in Indonesia and uh, people say that I'm from uh, from the country where we have uh, chess traditions and then I visited Indonesia <laughs> and I see how how much people love chess in that country and I was like maybe this is this is tradition of chess here this is really amazing Iran is also amazing. Uh, girl woman girl um and yeah who is also very very successful in chess and not only chess and it seems like all these people who are successful in in chess they can choose any profession later on and they can be still at the highest level yeah yeah irene is a very amazing woman um uh we could also show the Next, I wanted to talk to you about, um, speaking of the greatest of all time, we had Gary Kasparov come to our session, and he was very nice about talking about how we need to develop the next generation of female players, and of course, speaking to how Beth Harmon might inspire people. And then recently, we had um, my childhood hero, um, Grandmaster Judah Polgar, come to speak to the girls as well. And of course, that was, that was really memorable. Mm-hmm. To Let's say the least. Because Bertha from mm-hmm. Namibia. Hi, my name is Gisbertha Heitinge. I'm, I'm your biggest fan ever. My, my question was, what is your favorite opening? My favorite opening is the Sicilian. I always start with E4 with white. And uh, if I'm playing with the black pieces, I play C5 the Sicilian. I had many tons of games in the Sicilian different systems. And the reason is because uh, it is very tactical. There are a lot of combinations. There are a lot of uh, exciting things happening in that game. It's not very positional. It's more of a very concrete battle. And uh, you can do some unexpected things now and then. And I did to some people. 
We were going to show a game um, <laughs> after you leave, Judith. We were going to show a game that you played against um, Alexi Shurov um, in nineteen Argentina. <laughs> and I'm the black pieces. And my the main role takes the favorite piece of mine, the Knights. And, and that, that was a Sicilian theme tournament, right? Was that? Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. That was an amazing experience. It was uh, for the celebration of Polo Bayevsky who was a great personality, great uh, champion from the 60s, 70s, 80s. And uh, he has his own system in the in the Night of Variation, the Polovievsky Variation. And uh, all the games had to be played the Open Sicilian. So that was one game. But I had actually a beautiful game. Maybe you can show to the girls one time. Uh, my game against Kamsky when I was playing with Black. And what year was that one in? That, the same tournament from 94. I was playing with the black pieces and the last final uh, moves, I allowed Kamsky to queen his second queen, but still it was no help. Yes, that was that was amazing. I was um, so happy to have Judith speak. And you can see how charming and happy she was to you know, just kind of inspire this um, incredible generation of girls. Yes, and I love the I love the little girl who asked the question and who said that she's the biggest fan of hers. That was that was really sweet thing I have seen. Yeah, that was really cute. You might wonder why we had a girl from Namibia in our class because it is U.S. Chess Women. But actually, one of the things we did towards the beginning of the pandemic in partnership with the Lighthouse Chess Club. Um, Judy Caragu and also Grandmaster Pontos Carlson was we started this cross-cultural initiative between U.S. girls and Kenya girls. And that kind of grew because um, some other countries wanted to join. We had players from Namibia join. That was Giz Bertha. And the other day, we actually had some girls from Nigeria join from Tunde uh, Chess in the Slums initiative. So that was really fun as well. Um, Suzanne, uh, Susan Namga Namgali, who I think was your first interviewee, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. She's, she's, she's been to some of the sessions as well. Amazing. She's amazing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we do have these, this really great partnership with um, a cross-cultural program where, you know, uh, students from different African countries, starting with Kenya and now spreading to many more, and the American girls get to connect. One time we even had the great... Queen of Catway herself, Fiona Mutasi, come and join us. And that's oh, our, our next slide. Wow. Wow. Let's see this next slide. I really want to be part of a part of this program. Can Why I be a little girl? Next girls, and that is wrong. When they get being beaten, they always feel bad. And so how does that make you feel? Uh, yeah, it makes me feel bad. Bad, yeah. but when I beat a boy. It makes me feel good. I love that clip. Oh my God. I, I just have to see that every time I'm down. That girl is actually not Fiona, of course. Um, that's a younger girl. Her name is Elizabeth Cassidy. Um, she's a girl from Kenya. Very talented. I think she played in one of your Queen's Festival events. Um, but that was part of a confidence workshop. So the woman there, um, who's a friend of Pontus Carlson's, Lisa Batiste, um, gave them a workshop on confidence and I talked to them about confidence as well. And the idea is that a lot of times girls and women, they're not as confident as they should be. You know, they have so much knowledge and, and skill, but they sometimes second guess themselves. And that's a really difficult way to be at the chessboard or to be at a board meeting as well. So we wanted to work on, you know, just consciously attacking that and saying like, you can be more confident. So that was a workshop that was part of our cross-cultural initiative. But I also wanted to show you the actual slides of Fiona, not the video, just the slides of uh, Fiona Mutasi. Um, there's one, this of, one of her with her moving poster. Yeah. Um, oh, this one we already showed to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. This um, so this is Fiona Mutasi's movie poster. She was featured in the great Disney film, Queen of Catway. Definitely see it if you haven't already. It's on Disney+. Plus. Um, and so, cried yeah. already. <laughs> it was so good, yeah. yeah. And then the next slide is the actual Fiona herself. Um, mm -hmm. And this photograph is by uh, David Yada, who is a friend of mine. He's so wonderful. Fide is very lucky to have him. Mm -hmm. Although we, I think we miss him behind the camera because 
he just took like the greatest shots. <laughs> and uh, this is one of his, of Fiona Mutesi. And this is a, a position she played. So one thing we like to do is we um, show games by the speakers, right? So that the girls can not only get their wisdom, but also, you know, see one of the highlights of their own games. And this would was an example of one of the Fiona Mutesi games that we showed. And the question was black to play and then also white to play. So mm -hmm. you have to figure out how to defend if you're black. And then when black didn't defend as in the game, how to mate. Mm -hmm. And so this one is an example of one where you can show it to a player who's a little lower rated, right? Because the combination is not that difficult. But if you show it a few moves before, like two moves before, and kind of try to figure out how Black can make sure this doesn't happen to them, it gets a little bit more advanced. So that's kind of how we keep it modular mm -hmm. so that, like, everybody can join in in the fun. Mm -hmm. I see. And anybody in the chat want to say what Fiona should do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is... This is a little bit more explanation of the work that we do with uh, Lighthouse Chess Club and Business Meets Chess. Um, and we, we were able to actually send them some of our chess boards early on in the pandemic, mm -hmm. which was really nice, um, chess boards and hats. And they were able to teach us the chess pieces in Swahili, which is another example of that kind of cross-cultural education. Not only when we do these programs, we want people to learn about the countries that the girls are from, but we wanted to teach them language skills. So they learned about all the different chess pieces and the girls from Kenya taught the American girls about that. Uh, and that was very impressive to me because these girls have such great memories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they watched it once and they remembered it all. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was really impressed. You want to go to the next one? So speaking of cross-cultural education and also cross-disciplinary education, I was really excited to bring in the Botez sisters. I've also brought in other people who've been really successful in business who started out in chess. Two names that come to mind are Alyssa Malhina, who's an author, lawyer, chess champion, Yuan Luing Yuan, who is a chess champion and also a venture capitalist. So we try to bring in people who are successful in life as well as in chess. And I mean, what better example is that than the Botez sisters who've become, you know, mainstream influencers using the game of chess as a tool. And um, they came and gave a QA and a and had like a group game with the girls. Uh, and I think we have a clip of one of their insights, one little bit from the Q&A. Okay, let's take a look at this video. Hi, so first of all, I love your stream and I always find them super inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, and Andrea, um, I actually liked your Harvard essay, The Multicultural. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, God, I rewrote it. I'm still waiting on those decisions, but I'm glad somebody liked it. Thank you, Violet. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so my question was, what do you do when you experience burnout or feel like you're reaching a plateau with Great your chest? Great question. Um, so one thing I've learned to be much better about this year is burnout because I, I, I used to push myself to the point where uh, it was a little bit too far. So I actually ended up taking a month off streaming to just um, reset my timer. So obviously, I had to really actually learn this skill. So with burnout, I would try to say is, um, you really have to prioritize what you can do. You can do anything, but not everything. And you have to learn to say no to things that are less important. Otherwise, you're just not going to be able to get them done and try not to, to cut off sleep and still make sure that you, you know, you have your family and your friends and the things that are important to your life over just, you know, for a lot of so, so many ambitious girls to just do that and nothing else. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, for me, it was really finding that balance. I mean, I, I liked to dance and I wanted to be a competitive dancer and I was also playing piano, taking piano lessons. And then obviously we're both taking really challenging courses. And sadly, I mean, the truth was by junior year, I had to cut out dance and piano because I wanted to be full-time chess player. I wanted to reach Olympiad. So it depends on how big your goals are, but it, it, it's really difficult, like Alex said, to do everything you want. So what matters most to you? And then that's how you distribute your time. But it's really hard to have a lot of hobbies if you want to be really competitive. Yeah, 
this was obviously an extremely popular session because the girls love um, the Botez sisters. Um, a lot of the younger ones particularly relate to Andrea. And I think that um, their business skills are really important, the business lessons in this. I like what Alexandra said about you can do anything, but you can't do everything. I, and, and about how to, being very conscious of your goals. And I think anyone can learn from that, certainly any chess player. So those are the types of lessons that I'm trying to teach the girls through chess and through yes. these brilliant guests that we bring. Yes, that's, that was brilliant, brilliant. Uh, from Alexandra and hard not to believe in that. Are not to believe in that. Uh, and um, Bodice Sisters are very smart girls and true role models for many, many little girls. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, and, you know, by the way, um, I'll put a link in the YouTube chat just, just so that people can see it. There are longer versions of like almost all of these clips that I'm showing you. So if anybody wants to kind of like look up the actual full video of that Q&A, you can find it. And there's a lot more wisdom imparted. Uh, you know, that's one of my favorites. Uh, Gary Kasparov, of course, is also, you can find the whole video on that playlist. And Yuan Luing Yuan, Judith Polgar is going to be up soon. We're still working on the edit. But yeah, all these videos you can find. Um, because we, that the, one of the reasons we're, we do that is we edit them for like clarity and privacy. But one of the reasons it's important to us to put snippets and highlights for it online is because we do want grown up women and boys and men to be able to enjoy the videos too. Because I mean, boys have a lot to learn from these women. Uh, and we don't want to like not give them the chance to learn from them as well. It's just that the, the space itself, like the live event, it's a girl's event so they can make friends and socialize, but the actual wisdom, we want to really spread that to everyone. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's, one of the things we, we <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We're lucky actually at US Chess, we have the support of the St. Louis Chess Club and um, they help us give grants to different chess programs all over the country that promote girls and women in chess. And one that I actually recused myself from judging on, but that did get a grant was my brother's at uh, US Chess School um, with uh, girls programs for US chess school. It's, it's more advanced players. So it's like the top, top level players. And uh, he said it's important to him to have female coaches for the boys as well. So that was like his idea, his proposal, because I think that we really need to show boys that girls and women are really great players and that they can learn so much from them, because I think that creates the right culture in chess. So yeah, that's something to think about too. I, I always say that, that my girls programs, you know, right now we uh, are a smaller organization within the US Chess Federation, but as we grow, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try even harder to reach everyone because I don't think it's just about girls. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings me to my next topic, women. Mm -hmm. If you wanna go to the next slide. So we also offer programs for grown up women. Uh, we have beginner women's chess classes, and we have a mad women's book club, which is a forum where we get together with uh, women who are interested in a particular book, and we talk about um, both chess and also the literature of it. If you go to the next slide, you can see some of the guests that we've had for it. Um, I'm sorry, the font's a little small here on this one, so I'll just tell you that we've had The Queen's Gambit. Of course, we started with that. So we read the actual book, The Queen's Gambit. We also had Maria Konnikova, who's a great writer and a friend of mine come in. Um, John Urschel, who is a ex um, NFL football player and a writer and mathematician, as well as um, his wife, Louisa Thomas, who's a New Yorker magazine writer. And so we've had these special guests when the authors are alive <laughs> and they, they talk about the book and then in the cases uh, where it's an older book or the author has passed, we have some kind of special presentation related to the book. Uh, and the idea here, again, is inclusivity. So we want everybody to be able to enjoy this, not just, you know, chess masters. So we've had complete beginners who barely know the pieces, and we've had chess champions that can join in these sessions. The last one we did was called The Disordered Cosmos by a friend of mine, um, 
Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein. And that one was really valuable to me because um, Chanda is an astrophysicist, a theoretical physicist, but she's also made it part of her job to, um, to be on the humanities faculty at the university that she works at. And she's very focused on bringing science and physics to a broader range of people, right? So she wants more um, black children to be able to get access to science and to more to recognize more non-binary people in the field. And of course, that's really important to me in US chess as well. It's not just about women, it's about um, making sure that we're also thinking about intersectionality, you know, and that we're getting girls and women of all types. And that we're also thinking critically about gender and about including non-binary people too. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of thing when you, when you look outside chess, when you look at books and topics outside chess, you can see what other people are doing and kind of pick up what they're doing better than you and then hopefully give to them what you're doing better than them, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's why I think that ideas like this are really important for the growth of U.S. chess. Yeah, it's really nice. And um, yeah, this is about, this about wraps it up. I have a few photos at the end of other shots from some of the girls clubs initiatives. Now that we're often very lucky in the United States that vaccination rollout has been, you know, really efficient. And well, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get into, into the question of that, but let's just say that we've been very fortunate and a lot of Americans have gotten vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, especially me. I, I got access to it quite quickly in Philadelphia. So uh, things are really opening up again. Live tournaments are opening up again. So I'm very enthusiastic to get back to things like this. Or if you look at the next slide, um, this was from one of our girls clubs. And in fact, one of our major flagship events, the U.S. Um, Open, is going to happen in just a month. And the St. Louis Chess Club is putting on the U.S. Junior Girls Championship. And so we're back um, with our live events. And that's very exciting to me because I think that the hybrid is the future, that we have our live events. And that gets people super excited about chess and allows people to make stronger relationships. But that we also have our online events, which allows for greater accessibility, uh, both to people with disabilities or to people who can't afford to make it to live events mm -hmm. and greater accessibility to get people like Gary Kasparov and Judah Polgar who would not be able to travel halfway across the world for a one hour event. Mm -hmm. So for you, because you said you're interested in coming, Katty, and I'm super excited about that. I'm 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 open and, uh, for yeah. it. I'm I'm happy to, to to be there. I really want to be a little girl to to be part of the program because I see so many cool things are happening there. But I can't be I can't be younger than I am now. <laughs> so yes, I I hope not to well, be not, to be part yet. of it another way. <laughs> not yet. Not until we create a time machine. But hey, <laughs> yes. working with little kids. It certainly makes you feel younger, I think, working with little kids. I, I love, or, or kids or kids and teenagers, like I love, I really love it. I love um, connecting with um, people of all ages, but certainly there's something about, you know, working with youth that is, is very powerful as, you know, you're constantly reminded by how smart they are. And like when you oh, work yes. with people with, of other generations, you just, you pick up things that you wouldn't have noticed. Yes, I have I have a student six years old, little Madeline. She's she's amazing. I just love uh, I just love all the Sundays because I have one hour with her, <laughs> and we have really good connection. And yeah, she's amazing. I also learn so many things from her, and she gives so much positivity to me. And I love these colorful pieces that we see now on the board. I have never seen pink pieces or yellow pieces before. This is so nice idea, so nice idea. Love it. Thank you, yeah, I, I like it. I like it, but it's, it's controversial, you know? Like the thing is like, I think that uh, these like pink pieces and yellow pieces, like to me it's cool because I like, I'm very visual. You know, I have like an art, art, artistic background. As you, mm -hmm. as you remember, I gave up chess mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Um, so I love the visual side of it, but sometimes people find it like 
that if you use too many like bright colors and pinks that it's like you're talking down to girls or something. So we, we try to strike a balance, you know, mm-hmm. like have that kind of girly vibe for people who want it. And for people who don't, you know, they don't, they can use regular chess pieces and you see in the background, there's some mm-hmm. traditional ones. Yeah. And they're blue ones as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like, yeah. That's, like a, that's a good balance. <laughs> yes. That's, that's nice. That's nice. Um, do we have more photos maybe there? Uh, we have a, we have another, we have a couple pictures of, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the Queen's Gambit effect mm-hmm. and how powerful that is. And there's just this pictures of me, um, at the chessboard. Um, and it's, it's very far distance from the two photos, like over 10 years, but you see, I have the same focused face. Mm. And I think that that's one of the biggest benefits of chess to girls and women, because a lot of times girls and women are judged more on how they look. Mm -hmm. And in chess, you're completely absorbed in the position and not thinking about how you appear. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I think was very beautifully done, beautifully conveyed in the Queen's Gambit. If you go to the next slide, you see um, Anya Taylor-Joy playing Beth Harmon. And my favorite scene in the entire series where she completely loses her mind in the chessboard, you know, in a good way, like not like loses her mind, like goes crazy, more just like she, her brain like basically merges with the chessboard. And I thought it was such a beautiful portrayal of a woman whose mind was even more beautiful than her outside. You know, and of course, that's hard to do because Anya Taylor Joy is quite beautiful. Um, but <laughs> which, which was, which was another controversial thing. You know, like there was an article, there were multiple articles about how in the book she was not beautiful, Beth Harmon. Mm-hmm. She was only beautiful when she played chess. So this was a kind of like the author's conceit to um, show how magical chess was. That she was an ordinary. He even called her like. Um, not, not ugly. It's, it's homely. It's kind of like an old fashioned word to mean kind of like plain. People don't really use it anymore. But, uh, in the, he, he wrote the book in the early eighties. So he called her Beth Harmon homely. And yet when she played chess, she glowed. Right. So in the series, uh, they had a challenge that they needed to make Anya Teller Joy glow even greater than she did ordinarily. And I felt like they really achieved that. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing yeah. story of story chess, of chess. Yeah. and um, I have and, a feeling uh, that many chess players can find themselves in Beth Harmon in this one character. Yes, yeah, totally. I think that I think it it was very um, very exciting to me to see chess portrayed in that way. I'm seeing a couple of comments here. Mm-hmm. Um, we are an under eight. Girl and 50 plus women here. And we both benefited from US chess women's support through the, uh, oh, I, th- I see what she's saying. It's a, a daughter and a mom. And they both benefited from US chess women's support through classes at the Mechanics Club. Yeah, Mechanics was another one of the recipients of that St. Louis Chess Club and US Chess Grant. Um, so I'm glad, excess, wonderful. And if you guys have any other questions, you know, feel free to ask me now. Yes, this this is the this is a good moment. This is a good moment. I have a question, Jennifer. Um, you're very active. You're a very active woman. You are commentating chess tournaments. You're also playing. You are a mother uh, of a very beautiful little one, and also uh, also uh, you do all this work. Uh, so the question is how you find the balance through all these things. Mm, I struggle. Yeah, I do struggle with that. It's, it's, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I need some help in that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it is very difficult. I, I tend to be pretty busy because I'm always reaching for something new. Um, and, uh, maybe like I, I can, um, I can find some balance in exercise because it forces me to take some time off, you know, in playing with my son and sometimes even in poker because Mm -hmm. it's a game where you're forced to kind of like sit around and socialize and pay attention. So I I try to find ways to force myself to kind of like 
get out of the zone of work and to relax and enjoy myself a little bit. But it's not easy because there are so many fun projects to work on. (laughs) It's not easy. (laughs) Like I would be lying if I said that I had the secrets on this one. (laughs) Need more than 24 hours a day, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, and also we we all know that you are a fantastic poker player as well, and this is also something that uh, not many female poker players are out there, as I know. Uh, so what is what is your um, experience in that field, and if if chess helped you somehow to to be a better poker player? Oh yeah. Poker and chess definitely helped me to become a better poker player because I had never approached it as like a gambling game, always approached it as like something to study and get better at. And yeah, it, women are also outnumbered. So you need that confidence um, that you can that you can be the best and that you're not going to get intimidated. Um, so I, I, I love the game and I love the game of poker because of the ability to learn more about yourself like especially your own psychology and your own relationship to desire and money um, and fear. It's very good financial education. Um, I think it's really good for young people in that way. Like not really young, but, you know, like college students and stuff Um, and young adults uh, about investment it teaches you. But uh, chess is more of like an art to me. So I think that they really complement each other. Chess is like the artistic side and poker is like, the people side. Mm-hmm. And I, I have two podcasts. I have the Poker Grid, which is a podcast about poker, but it's also a bit chess inspired because the idea of the Poker Grid is that it's like a 64 square, I'm sorry, uh, 169 mm-hmm. s- flattened square of all the possible poker hands. And Ladies Night is my chess podcast. So um, I got a question here in the chat as X Suquez says, how can we help with the U.S. Chess Women's Initiative? Great question. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Well, I'd say, um, first of all, we really would love to see the number of girls and women in our programs go up. So encourage people, especially girls and women, to join U.S. Chess. Um, If you are in a position to make a financial donation, of course, any amount is very appreciated. And you can actually target it specifically to U.S. Chess Women. You don't have to um, you don't have to give to the general fund if you don't want to, although we welcome that too. And then also just sharing our our events, you know, like the videos with Judith Polgar and our podcast, like the one I mentioned with Irene Sukander. Uh, it, there's a lot of content out there. So it's a very competitive landscape. And the algorithms in social media usually kind of push ahead the stuff that's created by professional content creators. So, you know, if there's something you like, you know, to share it and send it to friends is really, really valuable to us. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. And it doesn't require any any big effort from all of us to share all these uh, amazing projects. And just let people know about it because, you know, sometimes just we don't know these things are happening out there and we need to to get more and more uh, people involved in it, right? Exactly, it, it is. And I, I try to do the same when I listen to a podcast or read a book. I try to remind myself that even if it's a famous author or podcaster, like they still probably, you know, don't get as many, you know, uh, retweets or shares as like, you know, the very, very top and they, they want more people to know about it. Um, and it's just the least you can do if you're listening or or enjoying free content, right? Like, why why not? Like, let other people know about it. It's like spreading the love. Um, somebody asks me, Stephen, if I I remember reading a great book that I wrote. Will I be writing any more books? Yes, I will. So you can follow me on at Jen Shahadi on Twitter and Instagram so that you can stay abreast of that. <laughs> It's amazing, Jennifer. It's so good to have you here. Thank you all, f- all for all this information that you just passed to us. Uh, and if anyone would like to uh, support all these pro- programs, please, please contact Jennifer. Uh, and also sharing is is big thing. Um, 
sharing yeah, through the social media all this information. Uh, so thank you so much for, for, for being a speaker of um, first Queen's Festival. I hope uh, many more festivals are ahead of us and also many big projects are ahead of us. Thank you so much, Ketty. I can't wait to connect with you again to get you to meet our girls. It's going to be so fun. Bye, everyone. Thank you to Fide for inviting me. Thank you, Jennifer. It was, um, it was a joyful uh, session indeed. Um, and also, we've got so much information. We're coming back in a few hours with another speaker. We have the same topic. We're talking about the uh, girls and women in chess uh, around the world. Um, and bye for now. <laughs>